All right, it is the tightest race uh, in a generation as far as the U.S. elections are concerned between Kamala Harris of the Democrat Party and uh, Donald Trump of the Republican Party. Let's try and make sense of the polls and who has the edge with exactly a week to go for the elections on the 5th of November. Dan Casino is a political scientist uh, from the Fairleigh Dickinson University. Thank you very much, uh, Dan, for speaking with us here on CNN News 18. Let's start with, you know, the polls, and there have been tons of them just in the last few days uh, alone. Uh, let's take the New York Times polling average where the lead between Harris and Trump is down to less than a percent. This is the smallest lead that she has had since the middle of August, and the indication, at least for the last three weeks, three to four weeks, has been that the gap is getting narrower and narrower, uh, and that Trump is managing to close that gap. Uh, first of all, would you would you put too much emphasis on that? What may it be because of? Uh, is it that Trump seems like the candidate who is coming from behind and could possibly score an upset win, the, the candidate with momentum going into election day? Or is that reading too much so into it? So what we always expect is the end of a race, you're going to see things tighten up. And that's most because Republicans start voting for the Republican candidate, Democrats start voting for the Democratic candidate. And the country is narrowly divided. So it's not surprising that the race tightens up. Uh, what is surprising is that Trump does seem making up ground. But that's in the polling. We're actually not seeing that sort of momentum in the early votes that have come in. Remember, since 2020, many Americans actually do vote before Election Day. And those numbers seem to be favoring Democrats. They seem to be doing better than they were in 2020. So we do have a problem with the polls. As many polls as we have, pollsters are still very worried that we're missing out on a lot of Trump supporters. In 2020, in the 2020 election, for instance, uh, we underestimated Trump by about two points in the polls. As a result, most pollsters are taking steps to basically add two points to the polls for Donald Trump in the hopes of making up that mistake. So if there is a polling error, it's probably on the part of overestimating Trump support rather than underestimating Trump support at this point. But but tell me this, uh, what does the early voting indicate? Uh, I believe more than 30 million Americans have already voted. Uh, in the postal ballots, I think the Democrats seem to have an edge. In the early in-person voting, it's almost neck and neck. Uh, it, it, does that necessarily give you an indication of how this race will, will break out? Not necessarily. So what it actually tells us is less about who's going to vote, because a lot of the people who are voting early would have voted anyway on Election Day. So it doesn't tell us about the composition of the electorate, but does tell us about enthusiasm. So people who want to go out and vote early are the most enthusiastic voters. It's also good for the campaigns to have early voters, because basically if once someone votes, you can stop putting time, effort, and money into trying to get them to the polls to actually vote. So the fact that we've seen this real surge, especially among young people uh, voting for the Democratic Party, tells us that they've activated this group of young people. And in the U.S., people 18, 20, 25 typically don't vote. The fact we're seeing so many of the voting in swing states like Georgia tells us that it's probably a good sign for Democrats. But again, maybe these people would have voted on Election Day anyway. We're all going to find out what's going to happen next why, Tuesday. Why is that happening? Because one of the big worries for the Kamala Harris team was that they're not able to break through to Gen Z, that Gen Z is switched off uh, from, from what's going on in this campaign. And more importantly, a lot of them are anti-war, and uh, the Biden-Harris administration has not done enough. Uh, to stop Israel in, in Gaza. That's, that's why Gen Z was tuning out of this election. But you're saying that the data on the, on the ground from early voting, initial days, uh, it may be completely different on, on polling day, but early voting seems to suggest that Gen Z is really turning up in big numbers. Exactly right. And this is actually a huge problem for pollsters. All of our likely voter models assume that young people under the age of about 30 really aren't going to vote or going to vote in very small numbers. The fact we're seeing these numbers tells us something else is going on here. And young people, of course, very hard also to get on the phone to do polls. So we don't necessarily know what's going on with them. We do know that there are groups of young people who are very upset about what's going on in Gaza. But there's, of course, also the case that Donald Trump is probably worse on Gaza than uh, Kamala Harris is. So we expect that people are very upset about that, not to vote for Trump, but basically to vote for no one at all. Uh, especially among young women, abortion is a huge issue. And the Harris campaign spent a lot of time trying to turn out young women. At the same time, the Trump campaign is putting effort into turning out young men with appearances on podcasts, talking about Bitcoin, and actions like this. The idea here is that both sides have basically said, we maxed out other voters. Turnout in the last election was as high as it's been in the modern era. So you're going to get new voters. You need to find people who otherwise don't vote. Young people seems like the best place to get those people. So uh, I think your latest FDU poll, which was released sometime in the middle of October, seems to show uh, that the actual divide, and we keep talking about how divided America is, you know, 
white versus black versus Hispanic, red states, blue states, etc. But the actual divide, and perhaps it might sort of show up in the polls this time, could actually be men versus women. And it speaks to the issue you were referring to a moment ago about abortion. Is that really the number one issue in this election? I would say it's not even about men versus women. It's about a subgroup of men, men who really talk about traditional gender identities. They want to be traditionally masculine. Among that group of men, it's about half of men. Trump is up by 35 points. Among all other men, Harris is up by 20, about the same as she is among women. It really is not about, uh, it's not about men versus women. It's about this one group of very traditionally masculine men supporting Donald Trump versus literally everyone else. And yes, this is the issues. The biggest issues we see on the ground in America today are abortion, immigration, and trans rights. And two of those three issues are very much about gender. And let's talk about the border because that, that at least the Trump team, thinks that that is the big weakness uh, for, for Kamala Harris and her team. Of course, she's got this sort of sticky situation where, on the one hand, she can't completely distance herself from the last four years. She was, after all, vice president. And yet, at the same time, she needs to outlay a plan as to how she's going to tackle the problem at the border. And the Harris campaign has tacked very far right on this, basically copying much of the Trump administration's uh, rhetoric on this, saying they're going to shut down the border completely, even to people like refugees who have a legal right to cross the border. Uh, so this has actually been very disappointing, I think, to a lot of progressives and liberals, saying you know, the Harris campaign has gone too far to the right on this. But the Harris campaign Democrats believe this is what cost them in control of Congress in 2022. And they're determined not to make that mistake again. Are we also seeing uh, an era in this, in this sort of uh, uh, election cycle where people are now reverting back to their cultural identities, uh, their, their, their sort of physical identities as the main reason or the main driving factor uh, for why they're turning up to vote and who they're voting for? Yeah, what we're seeing is a switch in what the main driving factor is. For a long time in the United States, it was race. It was blacks and Latinos and whites. And your racial identity mattered a lot more than anything else. What we're seeing now is that gender identity, being a man or a woman, or really more importantly, being you know your views about how gender should be, how men and women should behave, and the role of men and women in society, that that's the determining factor. Because we're talking much more about this. Our polling also shows that that is the core of Donald Trump's support, is people seeing him as being masculine, as being forceful. And that's so when people see Donald Trump as masculine, they tend to support him. The, so the key for the Harris campaign is to try and make sure that Trump is not seen as masculine, to try and say he's weak. You know, he doesn't, he's afraid of birds. He does all sorts of weird things. Like he's not a masculine guy. But at the same time, the Trump campaign has to also say that Harris is not masculine enough. She's not assertive enough. She doesn't have the leadership traits that are necessary to be president. This is a fight about masculinity and who's got it. And if it's about masculinity, uh, I, I want to sort of separate the two questions. One, how does that speak to a concern for a large number of voters, in fact, for uh, large parts of the world, is the next U.S. president has a pivotal role in ending these two wars, the one in Gaza and the one in Ukraine. Uh, and is, is Trump, because of his emphasis on masculinity, seen as more probable in doing that? And how much of a problem is that for Harris to tackle? And also, if, if this whole thing is about masculinity, then the question naturally arises, the corollary is, is America ready for its first woman president? So when it comes to the wars, it's kind of surprising the extent to which the American public is not voting on the basis of foreign policy. Generally, the American public doesn't care a lot about foreign policy. We, the American, you know, we care more about the war in Gaza than we ever did about the wars in Afghanistan or Iraq. Um, so the fact that the wars are up there matters. But the Trump camp, neither the Trump campaign nor the Harris campaign has really announced a big strategy for how to fix it. Trump campaigns basically say we should just give Latin whatever he wants in Ukraine uh, or Bibi Netanyahu whatever he wants in Israel. And the Harris campaign is trying to find a moderate view on this. So I don't think that's really a deciding factor here, at least for most voters. As for whether America is ready for a woman president, well, not quite yet, I think. You know, because in America, we still associate masculine traits with leadership traits. So you have to be masculine to be a leader. And therefore, any woman is going to be coming from behind. She has to prove she's masculine in a way that men don't. If Harris can get in there, though, then I think it's going to be a lot easier for women going forward. You know, the only solution to this is to basically elect so many women that nobody cares if you're a man or a woman anymore. So I want to come back to the, to the concluding part of our uh, interview, and I want to come back to where the polls are. 
uh, at least in the battleground states, because ultimately you have to win the battleground mm -hmm. states to win the presidency. You could be one, two, three percent up in the popular vote. It doesn't really matter. As Hillary Clinton found out in 2016, you have to win the Electoral College. So would it be a fair assessment to say that right now it looks like the so-called blue wall states, which is Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, uh, Harris has a slight edge, very much within the margin of error, and in the Sun Belt states, North Carolina, Georgia, Arizona, Trump is ahead. And if this stays, then Harris gets to 270? That's exactly right. So the blue wall states that, you know, this, these rust belt states in the upper Midwest that used to have factories and don't really anymore, uh, if all those states go for Harris, which is where the polls are right now, that's the blue wall. As long as she wins those states, she can lose all the other swing states and still win the election. And that does seem to be the strategy right now. Of course, as I said, we don't, the polls, even in those uh, Sunbelt states, in Georgia and Arizona especially, are very tight. And it seems entirely possible that she wins one of those states as well. And that's what we're looking for. Essentially, if Harris can take on election night, we won't know Pennsylvania election night, but she can take North Carolina or Georgia, Arizona election night, this is pretty much over, and we can all go to bed early. All right, Dan Casino. Uh, we'll hopefully be in touch with you uh, as and when uh, the election concludes on the fifth night or whenever we get to know, sixth. The last time, I think it took three days uh, for us to finally, at least at CNN, uh, to finally call the election. They declared it, I think, early on a Saturday morning. We hope it, does, it isn't such a long uh, uh, night or day uh, this time around. Thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure.